And I think we are at a point where we have transitioned to a very different paradigm in science. Historically, scientists would empirically observe the world, go away and think deeply about ways in which they could explain those observations. There would be a theoretical branch of science, the, the burgeoning realisation that mathematics underpins so much of the physical universe around us, and that meant that rather than just observing and trying to understand by reasoning, almost a, a natural philosophy, scientists who were excellent mathematicians could go away and use the logic and the elegance of mathematical reasoning in order to work out underlying principles that the world around us seems to obey. Then, several decades ago, with the advent of computation, people would code those elegant simplifications of nature, laws of nature, into computer systems and run simulations, and look at the outcomes, experiment after experiment, to try and understand some of the subtleties of the operations of the natural world. I would argue, as did Tony Hay and others in this excellent book on the fourth paradigm, that science has now transitioned to a fundamentally different place. Scientists are now, in some sense, relegated to be data recorders. Experiments are massive investments in recording data, and the science itself is then done in the data offline. And this is a fundamental change. The four areas that I'm going to highlight, which we'll be able to pick up on when we discuss things and uh, my colleagues will uh, discuss their work in that area, will be the use of algorithms to detect and discover, the use of algorithms given data to find underlying principles that explain the behaviour of that data, conservation laws and the like, the way in which algorithms can be used to form a human software symbiosis, because as Mike Aldrich elegantly said, we are still pretty darn good at many things, to bring the power of the scale of computation with human beings is a good thing. And also, I would argue very strongly, amongst many other people around the world, that learning itself is the epitome of the scientific paradigm. And I will briefly explain what I mean by that as I go through these uh, four categories. The first is detection. And this occupies a vast majority of the data throughput in the scientific disciplines around the world. What we're able to do is find those black swan events that have really good models for what we expect from the laws of physics or the known laws of molecular chemistry or whatever, and to screen our data for events that lie outside of our expectations. Learning itself is naturally driven by surprise. We learn by being faced with new things, and these algorithms are able very beautifully to find interesting items within the data. That leads to radical breakthroughs, in particular in areas of astronomy. Astronomy is still, as a subject, the largest data creator on the planet. It large astronomical experiments, including things like the Square Kilometre Array, which I imagine people have heard about, produce exabytes of data in a day. This approaches yearly internet traffic. So these are huge data projects and screening this large amount of data for anomalous interesting things is at a scale that is so beyond human, it must be done by algorithms. <clears throat> it leads to phenomenal sets of discoveries, um, which my colleague Suzanne will uh, talk about in a moment, things like finding planets around other stars, something which 50 years ago would have been thought of as science fiction. AI is transforming the life sciences, the life sciences themselves, and now censored science. By that I mean life scientists use measuring devices, sensors, <laughs> which they literally spread around their environment to record sound, environmental factors, movement of animals, the growth of plants, satellite imagery and beyond, all being combined to form an understanding and a situation assessment which they can use to advance their science. Extracting underlying principles from data, it is possible. In fact, as we have Newton being hit on the head, it is an apocryphal story. Algorithms now, faced with data, 
showing apples falling from trees, will infer Newton's laws of motion, will infer the fact that energy and momentum are conserved properties. They do that without being told to do that. They do that in a way by understanding these are the simplest general explanations that well explain the observations that have been seen, and crucially for science, they explain observations that are yet to come. So we can postulate experiments. Human algorithm symbiosis, using the best of the best, using the rate and veracity of algorithms to search, screen, and discover important information in huge data sets, combined with the subtlety and the holistic knowledge base that human beings have, be they volunteers <coughs> in a platform such as Zooniverse, a citizen science platform, or be they human science experts. Designing optimal experiments, I think, really eloquently describes the way in which the scientific process by itself links very beautifully with the learning process in machine learning and AI. We start out with a set of prior observations. These are things that we come into the world with, and we use those in order to form a surrogate model associated with the system under investigation. Crucially, that model contains information about where we are certain about the world, i.e. regions that we have copious measurements. Crucially, it also contains values that describe the amount of ignorance that we hold. And that ignorance is a recurrent theme in science and in many branches of probabilistic machine learning. Being faithful to understand what you don't know is the key to then actively go out and learn and improve the resolution of your understanding in those regions. So we postulate places where we are ignorant. We select experiments which prove or disprove and shrink our ignorance. We run those experiments, and this goes through a loop until we have sufficient resolution that we're able to postulate something more generic about the system at hand. This, in essence, is the learning loop, but it is also fundamentally the principle of science. We are honest, we are humble, and we try and promote an understanding of what we don't know so we can go out, take experiments, and improve our learning. And this leads, not stealing out of Andrew's thunder, to really interesting ways in which you can automate this process and automate that scientific refinement and discovery and improve the way in which you create quantum devices. So, I will stop talking now. Um, I'm afraid I will um, come back in and pretend to be Cathy. But in alphabetic order, I would very much like to uh, introduce my friends and colleagues. One of the great things about Oxford is this ecosystem we have of people who are passionate about AI. I would argue that the departments Mike Wardrich mentioned are at the core of much of AI research, but there is really significant innovation. These fine folks are not just users and consumers of machine learning, they're innovators as well. Vanilla algorithms out the box, from me or any of my colleagues, just tend not to work on the problems that they bring them to bear on. Therefore, this is an innovation cycle as well. So I'd like to, first of all, ask Suzanne Egner, Professor of Astrophysics, to talk a little bit about her work, hand over to Andrew Briggs, and I will come back in um, to sub in for uh, Professor Willis. Uh, Suzanne, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, first of all, thanks, Steve, for inviting me to talk about um, the way in which machine learning um, is affecting the area that I work in. I'm an astronomer. I study um, the observable universe for two reasons. One of them <coughs> is to use it as a laboratory to extract the fundamental laws of physics. Um, so many of my colleagues use um, the world around us as a laboratory. They can impact it. We can simply observe the universe and try to extract fundamental laws out of observation. And the other one, because specifically I work on exoplanets, planets that orbit other stars than the sun, I'm also interested in answering fundamental questions about our place as human beings in the universe, and also in providing um, other environments in which to test our theories of what happens on the Earth. So astronomy in general 
is an area that lends itself extremely well to the application of machine learning because it's highly data driven and it generates data sets which are enormous, as Steve already mentioned. The SKA, the square kilometer array that Steve referred to, is under construction currently, but they will produce data at such a phenomenal rate that it will be impossible to record this data. And we will rely extensively on algorithms to select what data we keep. So we have to be extremely confident in the power of the algorithms we use to, to keep the correct data. And this is in a context where we really want to find the unexpected signals. It's very difficult to do that. But it's not what I'm going to talk about today. In the area of exoplanets, um, the data sets that we're looking at are large, but they're not enormous. However, they're mostly time domain data sets. We observe how things change over time. And that comes with a, a very specific set of problems. Um, and the other thing is that we need extremely high precision because the signals that we're looking for from planets are very small. Planets are dark. Astronomers use light. So the only way we can find exoplanets is by looking for the tiny impact that they have on the light from the stars that they orbit around. So specifically, the method I've worked on most over the years is called the transit method, and it consists in looking for a small dip in flux, represented by this white line here, that occurs when a planet happens to pass in front of its star, as seen from the Earth. So this only happens for a small fraction of all planets, because most of them are not aligned in the correct way. However, it gives us very valuable information. We can measure the size of the planet relative to the star. And using other techniques, we can measure the mass, we can infer the density, and deduce what the planets are made of. We also learn about their orbits. This is a very rich source of information. However, stars are not the pristine canvas that I've shown here schematically. They are covered in um, dark spots. This is an image of the sun. Um, and you can see an active region here, which is a group of dark magnetic uh, regions of enhanced magnetic field. And you can see for comparison, this tiny dot here is the approximate size of the Earth. So if we're hoping to find the small dip that occurs when something like this passes in front of the sun, <coughs> we have to contend with the fact that these active regions here are going to cause fluctuations in the intensity of the light that we receive that are much greater than the effect of the planet. Furthermore, we observe this with instruments. Here, sh shown here is the Kepler Space Telescope. Um, these instruments are awesome. The, the precision and the stability that they deliver is incredible, but they're still not perfect. And so the data that we have to work with doesn't look like the idealized picture I've shown you here. This is an example of a light curve from the Kepler Space Telescope. And it's um, for what I would call a teenage star, so a relatively young star, it's suffering from a particularly bad case of acne. So it has really large spots, much larger than the ones that we see on the sun, and that causes these variations here. Furthermore, that data was gathered during a phase of the telescope's life when it wasn't able to control its pointing very well. And so that kind of sawtooth pattern that you see here is instrumental systematic effects. And those effects, both of them, are much larger than any signal from a planet, even a planet considerably larger than the Earth. There is a planet in that data set, but I challenge any of you to see it. So, and the other thing I should mention is that we have no way of predicting from first principles what either of the effects will be, the spot or the instrumental effect. But we do have some knowledge about them. We know that stars rotate, we know that they are covered in spots, and that these spots are mostly dark. And we know that the spots evolve, but presumably they don't evolve too fast. And we also know that we expect these sort of variations to be caused by the pointing of the satellite. So that means that they should somehow be correlated with where the star landed on the detector. So algorithms that enable us to put this knowledge in, but without over-specifying the model, without making assumptions that we can't justify, are very valuable. And this is where probabilistic machine learning and in particular, Bayesian stochastic models, um, such as Gaussian processes, which is the ones that I use in my research, are very helpful. So we learn the noise from the data, and it enables us to separate out the different components of the variability that we see. 
So here, the previous light curve has been decomposed into three components. The salt reef pattern, which is linked to the position of the star. So the only way we were able to extract this is by saying, give to me the component of the variation I see that can be explained by the position of the star on the detector. And then we have a component which is smoothly varying in time. And that is the one thing that we know about the star spot signatures. They should be smoothly varying in time. They shouldn't be suddenly varying. In this particular case, we can also see some element of periodicity. You can see that this wiggle here is a little bit like this wiggle here. Um, and we've built that into the model. When we have this information, we use it. When we don't, we don't impose it. If you look at the residuals, then these little dips pop out. They occur every 20 days or so, and they are the transits of an exoplanet. But we would never have found them were it not for the use of this kind of modeling. And if you try to separate out these signals using other techniques that, are, that don't explicitly take into account what we know about the different signals, this particular planet you cannot find. Because the time scales, for example, over which the transits occur are very similar to the timescales of the instrumental systematics. The amplitudes of the stellar variability are much larger. Okay, so another problem we often face when we have found a planet is, is it really a planet or is it an imposter? There are many kinds of astrophysical signals that can imitate the signal from the planet. This is essentially a classification problem. We're asking the um, we're asking an algorithm or a human being, or anything in between, a combination of algorithms and human beings, to tell us, based on the information that they have, planet yes or no. And this is something that's been done until recently, primarily using what we would call a mixture of experts model. So we <coughs> carry out a number of predefined diagnostic tests on the data, and then we combine them, usually in a qualitative way, this work is done by human beings, to decide whether something is considered a genuine planet candidate or a false alarm. But recently, people have started to apply convolutional neural networks to this problem and have had some very encouraging success, including the discovery of exoplanet candidates that have been missed in previous data sets. Not in the sense that the signals have not been found, but they have been wrongly identified by human beings as imposters. Um, now, one of the challenges is that we don't exactly understand what the neural net is doing when it tells us that something is a planet or isn't. And there's a lot of work going on into providing ways to explore and interpret the structure of the neural net. But the other thing that isn't mentioned on this slide is that this work was extremely encouraging, but the performance was not quite as good overall as the performance of the mixture of experts model. So this is still work in progress. It, the fact that this work was done basically in the space of a few months and almost caught up with the work of the entire exoplanet community over many years is extremely encouraging. But we need to do more to bring it to the level where it's genuinely useful to discover uh, new science. However, there's a recent piece of work uh, by a, a different team that took this algorithm and added one simple piece of domain knowledge into the inputs of the neural net and boosted its performance significantly. So that's very interesting. So I want to highlight one last area where I think uh, machine learning is not currently used, but it has considerably poten considerable potential. Um, we can look for the signal that happens when the planet goes behind the star. This we do frequently. If you do it in the infrared, it tells you how much thermal emission the planet is producing. And you can derive, if you make this measurement as a function of wavelength or color, you can derive a spectrum for, for the planet. To interpret this spectrum, you need to model the atmosphere of the planet and how it transmits light. The ingredients of a model like this are the composition of the atmosphere and the temperature, so how the temperature varies with altitude <coughs> of the planet. But to do this, to generate this black curve here, you have to compute millions of radiative transfer calculations. You have to calculate how the light is transferred through a small packet of gas in the atmosphere. And you have to explore all the parameters of the model. Um, you have to explore the composition, the abundances of the different gases, the, the, the temperature and the pressure um, in the 3D system that is the planet's atmosphere. 
These computations are very comp um, expensive. And so one area where of active interest is using machine learning to emulate a complex function, in this case, radiative transfer. Uh, and this can also have applications in climate modeling for the Earth. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up here, but I just I wanted to finish by giving you some of my thoughts about what I think are very desirable qualities for any machine learning algorithm to have so that it's useful for scientific research. Of course, it must be robust. We, can, we cannot afford to make claims that we cannot um, back up. And often, our data is not as simple as we would like it to be. So we, it's desirable that the algorithms we use um, don't... I, I want to choose my words carefully. We want the algorithms we use to fail loudly rather than gracefully, right? We want them to tell us when they don't know. It's also extremely important that these algorithms be scalable, and that's a problem, for example, for the Gaussian process methods that I use because they're actually computationally very expensive. So it would be very difficult to apply them to much larger data sets, although there's a lot of progress in fundamental mathematics that enables us to do this somewhat faster than we could even a few years ago. The other thing is we want them to be knowledgeable, and by this I mean we want it to be possible to put the knowledge that we have into the algorithm and interpretable. I would argue that um, if a machine learning algorithm is capable of giving me the answer, even if that answer is correct, if I cannot understand where that answer comes from, from the point of view of scientific discovery, I've only done half of the work. And so interpretability, I think, is a key property. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. One of the things I've been learning as we've uh, automated our laboratory using uh, AI is that AI is simultaneously universal. You only have to tell the AI system what it is that you want to optimize, and it can learn how to do it. And at the same time, very specific, so that you have to work extremely hard to make it successfully solve the problems that you're uh, seeking to apply it to. So I'm going to bring this to life by showing you how we apply machine learning to solve problems in quantum technologies. Uh, specifically quantum devices that are the core of quantum computing. You may know that's going to uh, make possible whole new kinds of computation following a, a national activity that I ran in the noughties. The government's now put another 585 million into developing quantum technologies. The ones we use work at low temperatures here in our lab, 20 millikelvin, that's colder than anywhere in the universe that we know of outside a human laboratory. And we're particularly looking at quantum devices that can contain either one or two electrons in individual quantum dots. And uh, what we set out to do, what we expected to do, was to use machine learning to solve the problem of how to measure these devices. And you'll see quite often I show you diagrams where we're controlling two different voltages and seeing what current flows. These currents are controlled by one electron at a time. That's what we expected to do. We succeeded, but the surprise we found, which we hadn't expected, is that the machine learning can solve the problem of tuning up these quantum devices. And that's a hard problem. Over here, current just flows all the time, so it's no good. Over here, no current flows. In this region here, you get the really significant quantum effects occurring, uh, of which the signature of these pairs of triangles. You'll see that later. <coughs> I'm going to show you how we've applied it to those devices, but in fact, all candidate implementations of quantum computing have this challenge of how do you tune up the individual quantum devices with the extreme delicacy that's required for these fragile quantum states. And uh, Steve has already shown you an illustration of how we do this. We make sparse measurements, here 8 by 8, 64 measurements. The machine, on the basis of the training it's already received, says, well, the full picture could look like this, or like that, 
all like that, all like that, in fact, a hundred different possibilities. All of them different because of the uncertainty. You can think of machine learning as the science and engineering of making good decisions in the presence of uncertainty. It then calculates an information gain map, and the darkness here is a measure of how much you will learn by making a measurement at that point. So the darker it is, <clears throat> the more good that measurement will do you in terms of increasing the accuracy and reducing the uncertainty. The machine then uh, decides when well, you should make measurements here and here and here, and it goes round the loop, calculates a new information game map, and so on. So here it is actually doing it. On the left, you can see it's already made 64 measurements. It's not going to learn much from make measurements at those 64 points, so they're dark. And the more colored regions here are where it will learn most. So here it is running in real time. And on the left-hand side, these are the new measurements. On the right-hand side is the updated acquisition map. And you see that by now it's already learned everything it's going to learn. I can show you another example. And the questions you ask yourself as you look at the next example is, when have I really learned enough and I can stop? So here's another example. And in particular, in this case, it's wanting to find out where's this region where the interesting quantum phenomena are happening. And you can see by now it's found it. So all the rest of the measurements are unnecessary. And this is where the huge speed up is coming because it's focusing on those measurements that are going to tell us most, making those initially, and thereby speeding up many fold the, 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 the speed with which we can measure and characterize a device. Now that's measuring it. But now there's a much harder task, which is tuning up these quantum devices. And when people publish their papers, you know, they, they show you the data they've got on a device that may have taken uh, weeks, sometimes months, occasionally days, if they're lucky and get good at it, to tune up. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find this region of uh, good quantum behavior. These contours are contours of a high score for the quality of the performance. So let me uh, skip through a few slides. And here you see uh, where the machine is getting increasingly high scores. This was 8.2, 8.3, 9.8, 10.6. And why has that one got a high score? Answer, because it's found that pair of triangles that are going to give us the nice quantum behavior that we want. But we need to do better than that. So we now we've developed another method, which will get better at homing in on those. And this works by um, making a measurement of a small volume of parameter space, and then asking, in which direction should I move to make the best one, based on what I've already learned from the training data. Here's the answer. There are the good double triangles. And you see how efficiently the machine has learned to make the next measurements towards those, quant those uh, triangles. There, it's found them. And then we want to get even better still, because we're actually measuring in multi-parameter space. I'm only displaying two parameters. But really, we've got actually eight different voltages we're controlling here. And here it is working through and tuning up those double triangles. I hope that shares with you something of the excitement. These things take a human uh, days, weeks, sometimes longer. The machine did this in an hour and a half, and it's getting faster at it. And if you think that the eventual quantum computers are going to have not one of these devices, but hundreds, or you know, before too long, five million of them, you see that this use of machine learning for controlling the experiments in real time, all of these are controlled by the machine, is not just speeding up and accelerating the science research we can do. It's actually going to enable us to do science and enable us to build technologies in ways that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, you've heard how um, there are fabulous numbers from the whole university about the spin-out companies, the developments, the uh, combinations of expertise. That's happening at a bottom-up level in individual laboratories like mine. We've got graduate students queuing up because they see this as the pathway to really exciting science and really exciting career. 
and we've got industries queuing up to come and invite us to work with them to tailor the techniques that we're developing to the challenges that they face in their technologies. So I think given that uh, we would like to uh, capture a little bit of time, um, I might just very, very briefly <coughs> give an overview of um, Kathy's work and the, the area of work that's, uh, oh, it's all gone blank. I can see it on my screen, but, uh, hello, yeah. Um, this project, <coughs> this was a project funded, uh, it won a Google uh, Impact Award and has now been uh, funded uh, very kindly through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this work that Kathy has been leading, which I um, have a pleasure to be involved with, is actually about using uh, AI algorithms on low, low cost budget smartphones to detect that characteristic audio signature of a buzzing mosquito. There are many species of mosquito, not all of them vector malaria, only the wrong species. <coughs> And indeed, only the females, when they're pregnant, who need the proteins to incubate the eggs. They're normally nectar feeders. So this is a very complex problem. We do need it because it's one of those diseases that could be eradicated, not by getting rid of mosquitoes, but by getting rid of the malarial parasite, but understanding a lot more. So if I very briefly sort of go to some of the, uh, the sort of results, um, these, are, these are location maps that come from the Malaria Atlas Project showing across the world how malaria and the different species spread geographically. Knowing where you are and understanding with that audio detector enables you to map mosquito prevalence rather than map the detection of malarial cases as well. Very difficult at the moment. People have to go out, track mosquitoes, mush them up, look at their DNA, and work out what species they were. So it's very time consuming. And of course, we can do this. We can do this on a smartphone. Um, these different mosquitoes have subtle different frequency spectra associated with their wing beats, because the wings are different shapes, and they, they uh, operate at slightly different frequencies. And we're able, with relatively high accuracy, to work out the species in the wild. And I find that absolutely amazing. Something we can hear that annoys us when they're lying in bed, it always seems to be there. We can use a smartphone and we can get valuable information. This is all going to the large database to help uh, with. This would have been a little video. I'm not sure whether it's, uh, uh, it will run. Uh, yes, that is. Ah, there we go. That's running now. Number 20. So this... number 21. Background, somebody talking. Sometime number 22. <laughs> so this is a this is a fantastic a fantastic bit of work led by Kathy. I will stop there. I'm afraid I don't really have time to do it justice because what I'd really like to do in the last five minutes, if we may, or a few minutes before we uh, we round up, is to just get the thoughts from our panelists. And the first question, maybe if I uh, I start with you, Suzanne, ask. You mentioned about insight. Are not the laws of physics so simple and insightful because of the failings of human understanding? The universe is complex, answers should necessarily be complex. Are not our algorithms able to produce a richer understanding of the world around us? It doesn't matter that we understand their interpretation. That's a very interesting question, particularly in the context of what I think is one of the biggest problems in science today, certainly very present for anyone who studies planet. Planets are complex systems. I, I still believe that the laws of physics may well be quite simple, but we see them at play in extremely complex ways when we are looking at something like a planet. We have many um, different uh, phenomena taking place in the smallest parcel of air, um, and this doesn't even bring into the picture uh, biological activity, for example, or geophysical activities. <coughs> and we don't have any hope of um, 
being able to model these in their entire complexity from first principles. So I think an area where machine learning could be extremely helpful in the long-term future is to allow us to develop ways to extract information from complex systems. Um, and it, in a sense, I would say it doesn't matter if these are uh, the fundamental laws of physics, but they will be the fundamental laws of time. So I guess that's a short answer given the time. Thank you. Andrew, we've seen some phenomenal examples of how AI and machine learning seem to be augmenting human scientists. <laughs> Can you see a future in which, as Mike Waldrich <coughs> elegantly described, more general AI, which understands the narrative of reasoning and understands internally much more along the meaning? Can you see a future for human scientists if we move to an era in 50 years of general purpose AI? They are simply better than us at doing science. <laughs> I love the question. Three years ago, we set ourselves the goal in my laboratory that within five years, the machine would decide what to measure next to the standard of a second year graduate student. That's a rather elastic measure, but there you go. <laughs> the graduate students uh, said, well, what about us? What should we do? To which the answer was, get your PhD quick before the machines take over. <laughs> we were wrong about thinking we could do it in five years. It actually took a year and a half, and the machine was already taking better decisions than humans about what to measure next. It's now also better, as I showed you, at tuning up uh, devices, and, and that's more generally applicable. And one of the students in the lab put it in a lovely way, he said, it's as if all your life you've been washing your shirts in the bathtub with the bar of soap. And you don't enjoy doing it very much, a bit of a chore, but it's the only way to get your shirts clean, so you cheerfully do it, until you acquire a washing machine. And all you have to do is put the clothes <coughs> in, put the detergent in, shut the door, press the button, two hours later you come back and your shirts are clean. That is what is now happening with setting up the experiments in the laboratory. And it is liberating the students to be able to go and have a cup of coffee, if you like, or probably more, to think creatively about what are the really important questions to ask, and how do we make sense of the data. And I think the key to your question, Mike, is you talked about the machine understanding I don't think we have the slightest idea what it means for a machine to understand something, but I think we have a sort of sense of what it means for humans to understand something, and a sense that that is, for humans, something that is culturally hugely, hugely enriching <coughs> and technologically hugely enabling. Thank you very much. I would just like to take this opportunity I don't think, given uh, we want to keep a little bit of time, that we have an opportunity to take any questions now. But uh, my colleagues here, I'm sure, will be around over coffee. Please do give them a very warm round of applause. <laughs>